And welcome to another episode of The Family Couch. Today, I am so excited to have with us on as our guest, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. And we're going to be talking about how to create healthy spaces for Black women and Black girls. And it is one of those topics that I have had a wonderful um, experience with, with Dr. Joy and, and the work that she does. And so I wanted to bring her on today to talk more about that and how to really just have a good, healthy discussion about what it means to be a Black woman in the world and how we create healthy spaces for ourselves. And so, Dr. Joy, thank you so much for being on with us today. Thank you for having me, Mercedes. <laughs> so before we jump into this awesome topic, I would love for you to give our audience a bit more about who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am a psychologist here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my practice clinically focuses on helping women to recover from breakups. Um, but my larger platform, like you've mentioned, is called Therapy for Black Girls. Um, and girls is used very colloquially. So girls from like girls, girls, to young girls to actually grown women. Mm -hmm. um, and I really want to, the, the focus of the platform is really about making mental health very relevant and accessible for Black women so that that becomes a priority for them, learning how to set healthy boundaries, how to have more assertive communication, how to screen for like depression and anxiety, like other mental health concerns that they may be having, really just wanting to help Black women focus on really taking good care of themselves. Yeah. And like I said, I love that platform. And that's how I came into contact with you by um, learning about the work. And so can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of came into that? Because you said that your practice is about like relationships, but how did you come into this platform and this idea that I need to create a space for women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my focus has really always been working with Black women. It just has not been as formal as like everything being called therapy for Black girls. But much of my career has been spent working with Black women in either individual therapy or groups. Um, but therapy for Black girls actually came into existence in September of 2014 after I watched the Black Girls Rock Award show on BET. Um, so I just remember like being so inspired by that entire show, right? It just felt like the energy was palpable, like you could feel it even though I was not in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, you know, like, how could I do something like this for mental health? Like, how can mental health feel this cool and accessible? And then Therapy for Black Girls just kind of popped into my mind. And I went to see if the domain was available, and it was. And so it was kind of born that way. I love that. And I love kind of what you share, where it's like you saw this in the world, and you saw kind of the entertainment world taking on this mantle and this platform. And you're like, hey, we need this in mental health, too. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure, as you see with, with Black women in mental health, we don't always get the training and the knowledge around how to care for ourselves emotionally and mentally. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of time spent taking care of other people and tending to other people's needs and not our own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so kind of talking about it broadly, and then maybe we can kind of narrow it down as, as we get into our conversation. What does that mean for you to create a space um, in the mental health field for Black women to feel comfortable? What does that look like for you? And what does that mean to you? Well, for me, I mean, I think specifically in my office, it means that people feel very welcome. Um, you know, like I, I, my artwork is very Black centric. You know, like I feel like I really want to create a space where people can kind of see themselves and also like let their hair down. That doesn't have to be this pretense of like having to have it all together mm -hmm. um, to come into therapy. Like you can really come to this space and be yourself and I can hold whatever you tell me and there is no judgment and really this is a space where you can kind of come and really just be yourself and then largely with the platform I want to kind of have an expansion of that right mm -hmm. so that um, a large part of the therapy for black girls is a therapist directory mm -hmm. where I have um, black women therapists across the country for people who are looking for individual therapists um, because it has been my experience that black women typically want another black woman therapist um, for whatever reason right but we we know that the most important aspect of whether therapy is going to be effective is whether you feel comfortable with your therapist. Mm -hmm. Is there a strong alliance? And so if sitting across from another Black woman is what is going to help you to get the help you need faster, then I wanted to be able to kind of create a platform that allow people to do that. Um, yeah. So really creating spaces where Black women can, again, continue to take care of themselves in a way that's good. Yeah. And as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking, how do we kind of 
also reset the rhetoric that we have to have it all together. You know, there is this um, this myth or this image of the strong black woman. Mm-hmm. And so you, I feel like sometimes you might be contending with that where I'm good. I got it. I got God. I got this. I'm straight. <laughs> How do you kind of help kind of help women to feel like, okay, it's okay if I have a therapist. It's okay if I have to talk to someone about my mental health. How do you mm-hmm. kind of help reconcile those two images, if you will? Yeah, that is a very good point, Mercedes. And I do think that um, even when women decide to take the step to enter therapy, there's still some work that needs to be done for them to even kind of let go of that facade of having to have it all together. It kind of reminds me of, and I don't know if this happens in other cultures, but I will frequently hear like black women friends talk about like even getting um, like a housekeeper and they will like clean up a little bit before the housekeeper gets there so that you don't look like a total slob kind of thing. And it it feels like that to me with Black women going to therapy, too. Like, okay, I'm going to let them know just a little bit, but I don't want them to necessarily know how awful I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really feel like some of that comes with taking time and really helping women to understand um, that they won't be judged. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I I also think that when there is another Black woman therapist, even even though you've self-selected a Black woman as a therapist, there is still some pretense, I think, of like, do I want to kind of be bare naked in front of this therapist um, because she looks like she has it together and I don't, and what does that mean? You know, so I think we have to even have some of those conversations as therapists and invite that into the room um, because they may be afraid, afraid to say that. Right. Because there is that image, right, of the strong Black woman. So you, mm-hmm. you feel like I have to have it together. And if I don't, then maybe I am betraying my culture. I'm betraying my identity. Is that something that you see sometimes too happening with women that when they do finally feel like they've let it all, you know, hang out and be raw, that they feel like they might be betraying their identity or their culture in some way? Yeah. And I think that that is oftentimes why Black women miss some of the signs of more serious mental illness, because there is this need and, um, you know, kind of stereotype of having it all together. And so sometimes they will be, you know, be so successful in business and their careers and taking care of family and that all that kind of stuff. And so they're kind of distracting themselves from, you know, these other symptoms that may be going on because they're so busy in other areas of their mm-hmm. lives. Mm-hmm. So I do think that is also why many Black women don't realize that they are struggling with depression and anxiety and other things because they are so, you know, kind of wanting to uphold this strong Black woman myth. Right. And I might ask, I'm going to ask a little bit of a controversial question. Do we also sometimes, and do you also sometimes see that maybe these symptoms that come up, women kind of attribute it to uh, another culture's kind of issue where it's like, oh, that's their issue. We don't have that. You know, they have depression. We no, there's, we don't have depression. Yeah. I mean, I think that that is like a a larger conversation just around the stigma of mental health treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, black people don't go to therapy. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't have to go talk to somebody else about our business because we can take care of it ourselves. Absolutely. That's a thing. Right. Right. And so how do you kind of, and maybe you're doing it, you know, maybe you're thinking about how to do it, but how do you kind of help kind of mitigate some of those myths and maybe kind of, kind of diffuse some of those things that might keep people from looking on your directory and finding help for themselves? Mm-hmm. I think the, the best vehicle um, that has been like helpful in me doing a part of that work has been the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had not mentioned the podcast, but Therapy for Black Girls is also a podcast, um, which you have been an excellent guest on. And I think having um, conversations with different therapists or whether it's the solo episodes that I have that talk about all of these different issues. So how do we parent more effectively and kindly? How do we address emotional eating? How do we manage grief? Do you know how to manage anxiety? Like all of these things that are things that typically would bring a client into the office, having conversations on the podcast, I think allow people to say, oh, I'm struggling with that. And I might be able to go and see a therapist about that. And there wouldn't be anything wrong with it. So I think hearing these conversations every week really helps people to kind of realize how many different ways you could use therapy and that you don't have to be crazy, so to speak, to be able to really effectively use therapy. Yeah. And I'm so happy you mentioned the podcast because it brought me kind of brought me uh, to the front of mind of you do a couple episodes or you've done a couple episodes where you also um, have a guest on and you guys talk about some of the African-American female um, characters that are out in the world. So you've talked Mm -hmm. about Olivia Pope, I think. I know you've talked about, um, I think maybe even Issa Rae and and, uh, Insecure. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about how doing that kind of also helps people to identify maybe with some of their issues and some of their struggles. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, like you, we talked about before, um, you know, there haven't been as many like black women movies about like friendships and things like that. And I think there's also, even though we're getting more, there is also a shortage of like black women characters that we typically see in our TVs and movies. And so when we see these these characters like Olivia Pope and Molly from Insecure, like you yes. mentioned, yes. Um, Molly was a character. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, we can also see that they have stuff going on, right? And again, as a therapist, is, and I think I approach like pop culture in this way that I'm always looking at like what's the connection I can make to help you know kind of bring the, the therapy slant in and so when I look at these characters I can see like oh if this person were my client these are the kinds of things that might bring them in and this is how I might help them and those have been some very popular episodes as you can imagine because people can see themselves in some of these characters now you might not have as extreme of a life as Olivia Pope but you may have, you know, like a tense relationship with your mom or like a very weird relationship with dad or relationship issues where you're kind of, you know, having struggles, having a committed relationship. Like people can see themselves in those kinds of issues. And so I think talking about those things on the podcast really helps people to understand how you could use therapy to, to work through some of those issues. Yeah. And I think, too, if we're, you know, still on the t topic of, you know, representation in the media, I also think, because I know I'm older, and when I was growing up, you either had the really hood girl, or, you know, like, you didn't have a lot of different women to look at and say, okay, this, these are the different ways African American women exist in the world. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like now, in terms of creating these bigger spaces, that media does have more diversity in even how they portray African American women in their, co in their characters? Do you feel like that's helping create a bigger space as well. I do think that some of that is changing, but I think I'm even more encouraged by how Black women are taking creativity into their own hands and creating their own things. So like you mentioned Issa Rae, so she has her show on it's on uh, HBO, but she also has an entire like production company where she does all of these like web series and, you know, things that are on, you know, like not on HBO, but still accessible to <laughs> you know, tons of people. And I think that has given us a greater variety of like what different black women look like across the spectrum. So yeah. that's more encouraging to me that, you know, it's not, of course, as big as an HBO, but I do think that there is good work about black women out there if you want to find it. Yeah, yeah. And so for, I would say, professionals who are looking to create these spaces and you mentioned therapy for black girls so there's definitely a wonderful community of african-american therapists who are like we are ready to step up we are ready to create these spaces what would you say or what kind of ideas do you have for other therapists who are like okay i also would like to be able to create these spaces i also would like to be able to share that i'm a space for black women as well how how do we begin to do that or how do you think we can begin to do that in a mental health world Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of that really involves paying attention and making sure that you've done your own work, um, you know, because I think sometimes, you know, with like non-Black therapists, you know, they may be well-meaning, but will like put their foot in their mouths and create like these microaggressions in therapy that then cause people not to want to try therapy again, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it does really involve you doing your own work and making sure that you are setting up a space that allows people to come in with any kinds of challenges that they are working through, you know, especially kind of given what's going on in the world now, increasingly now with like the political climate, I do think it feels very chancy for a black woman to come into a therapist who is not another black woman maybe and, and kind of maybe be honest about what they're feeling about what's going on in the world. So I think a lot of that really involves you doing your work and making sure that you're communicating that in your literature. You know, like if I go to your website and all of your stock photo pictures are people that don't look like me, that to me communicates that this is not necessarily a space for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think even things as small as that, you know, we really have to be intentional about making sure the space feels like it is accessible for a variety of different people. Yeah. And you mentioned a term that is one that kind of has become a little bit more salient in our multicultural language and, and uh, vocabulary. And you said microaggression. Can you tell us a little bit about what that word means and maybe how it shows up in the world, even in the mental health world? Yeah. So, I mean, so microaggression um, is what may be kind of like a passive or a subtle kind of thing that would like raise somebody's hairs, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like if we think about it generally, like if you're shopping and you notice that like somebody in the store is kind of following you around, 
um, while you're shopping and it's not bothering anybody else and you're a black woman. Well, that's a microaggression, you know, like, so it could be said that you're just doing your job, but what it feels like is that I'm being targeted because I'm a black woman and you maybe suspect that I'm going to steal something or something like that. Right. Um, and so in the mental health world, that may mean that you make comments um, about, you know, like how often I change my hair, like hair tends to be a big one, um, you know, and I think it, it probably feels very innocuous, but are you making those same kinds of comments to your non-Black women clients, you know, like are you paying so much attention to their hairstyles and, you know, making comments about that? Like it just, are there just things that you probably don't have a second thought about? But because of our experience in the world, we're very attuned to things that may communicate something that indicates that this space is not safe for me. Yes, yes. And, and I bring that up because I think, like you said, I think a lot of clinicians kind of pride themselves on holding space for clients, but at the same time, sometimes don't understand the different cultural um, sensitivities of different clients that don't look like them. And so you also said, that, and this is kind of leading me into my next question, you were also saying that a therapist who maybe is working with a client like a black woman or someone that's not of their cultural identity um, needs to do their own work. And what do, what do you feel like that entails to really kind of be able to be prepared to hold a space for someone who isn't your cultural identity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's some excellent like syllabi that colleagues have put together that really talk about like examining white privilege. There are some excellent um, trainings that people are doing. I just had a conversation with Shauna Murray Brown, um, a therapist in Baltimore who is doing some amazing work mm -hmm. in terms of like anti-racism work and liberation focused work for black people. And so I think you really have to be intentional about seeking out some of those training opportunities mm -hmm. because I don't know about you, Bert and Mercedes, but we had like one intro level multicultural counseling class in my doctoral program and that was it. Yeah. You know, so I mean, so to really kind of say that you're going to um, really kind of throw yourself into doing some of this work and being being able to kind of pay attention to being intentional about holding safe space for people, you're going to have to go beyond like what we typically are given in our in our programs. And I agree with that. I think same here, just, you know, one um, really intense class about it. And then maybe every now and then the the more culturally competent professors would kind of intersperse it in their lectures. But I even with CEs that come, CEU packets that come into my home, there's not enough about other cultures at all, not just African-American cultures, but any other type of cultural identity or any other type of gender identity or sexual identity. I feel like that idea of diversity just isn't still, it's not very resonant in, in the mental health field yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, and I have to say this in the middle of the interview, I feel like people like yourself and um, Shauna, May, Shauna Murray too, they are, you guys are kind of paving that way and saying, hey, look, there's ways to talk about this and we're going to set up these platforms for you. So I want to really say thank you for that and being so bold with your platform and being so honest and authentic with it. I think it's kind of paving that way for people to say, okay, yes, we need to listen and <laughs> put this out there. Sure. And if you haven't thought about it yet, you know, if you want to do a CE you know, of course on that. I had not thought about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but kind of going back to and maybe bringing it down to the, the individual level, the family level, when you have a, a family that's kind of as part of the world and they're seeing the world out there, how do, or what kind of advice do you have for families who want to teach their young black girls to exist in a world that doesn't always see them and doesn't always know how to honor them? What kind of ideas or, or strategies or tips do you have for families who may need some of that? Yeah, I think, you know, again, I think it comes to being very intentional about like creating different kinds of experiences for your children. Um, so especially if you maybe don't live in an area that has like a lot of other black families or like black organizations that you can get involved in, you'll probably have to hunt a little harder. Um, but I know that there are lots of different uh, organizations for black families, like some of the fraternities and sororities will have like a junior league version of the sorority or, you know, so that you can get involved as a child. Um, you know, I think there are organizations like Jack and Jill across the country, um, different organizations related to like YMCAs and YWCAs. You know, like I think you do have to make sure that your black children are interacting with other black children so that they have affirming experiences. And for, you know, non-black parents, I think that you also need to be be careful of what kinds of language and what kinds of messages you may be communicating to your children about black children, mm -hmm. you know, because they all go to school together. And, you know, I have been very concerned about like the increase of like 
these race driven kind of um like episodes in schools you know in mm-hmm. some like very very young children and you know of course that that comes from like what they're hearing in their home so yeah. i think we have to be very careful and mindful that our children are picking up you know all kinds of conversations and when mm-hmm. we're talking about things and what we're watching and they are picking up more than we sometimes even know yeah and it's interesting that you bring that up because i was watching our uh, 42 uh the chat the Jackie Robinson story and Chadwick Boseman plays him. And in one scene, uh, the young boy, there was a young boy there in the stands and he was, dad, I'm so excited to see, you know, the Dodgers play. And I wonder how so-and-so is going to score. And the dad was having a really endearing conversation about his first time seeing baseball. And it was a very endearing moment. But then in the next scene, Jackie Robinson steps out onto the plate and the dad begins to shout racial slurs and, you know, things like that. And the little kid begins to do it too. Right. And in that scene, you see what the director is trying to show us about how easy it is for kids to go from one minute being very innocent and excited to watching all these other men in the stands shout racial slurs to feel like, oh, I have to do this, too. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really resonant what you're saying about how we have to be mindful of how we're talking um, around our kids, not maybe to them, but around them. I'm sure no no parent goes, hey, go to school and do this. But they hear you and, you know, they hear you on the phone. They hear Mm -hmm. you outside talking to your friends and your neighbors and yep. they pick up on it exactly um so i feel like we could definitely talk about this all day there's so many other questions i want to talk to you about and i'm so happy i have access to you outside of this <laughs> <laughs> but i definitely want to give you a space and an opportunity to let our audience know how they can connect with you and how they can learn more about getting more information about your work and the things that you're doing Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as we've mentioned, you know, therapyforblackgirls.com is like the online hub for all of my activities. Um, you can find information and listen to the podcast episodes there. You can access the therapist directory there. I also have some blog posts written there um, about a variety of different topics. Um, and then on social media, I'm very active on social media and have I think that that has been a very cool experience to be able to like talk to listeners from the podcast and just listeners from across the country about like their thoughts about the different kinds of topics that I'm talking about. So it's been cool to see how um, engaged could the community has been and that there has been such a positive reception to Therapy for Black Girls. Um, so on Twitter, you can find me at Therapy4, the number four B girls. And then on Instagram and Facebook, you can find, find me at Therapy for Black Girls. Nice. And I highly recommend anyone listening to definitely check out uh, Dr. Joy's work and her social media because, yes, she is very active and she always has such enlightening um, shares, not just her own stuff, but you always share things like on Twitter and Facebook that I'm like, oh, that's a great article. And this was a great piece that you were sharing. So if you're someone who cares at all about mental health, especially mental health for people of color and women of color, I think following her is a really great space to do what you were saying during the interview, which is do your own work. Mm-hmm. you know find those sources and don't just kind of ask all the time but say well just like I would want to know you know where my directions are I go to Google you know Google some stuff <laughs> and out, you know so I'm definitely on that wavelength um, but I want to say thank you so much uh, for being on with us today sharing so many different insights and so many different pieces um, that I hope our listeners will take from and, and grow from absolutely thank you for the invitation Mercedes <laughs> bye bye Thank you.